Hello and welcome to Glaswegian Geeks. Today we have our little comic of the month. It's going to be a very special show today. Uh, we've got a little pre-recorded segment with Matt, who, once we were last round seeing his lovely little face, we got him to choose a graphic of the month. Well, you see, the thing is, is Matt lives in the middle of nowhere, see, so we have to do yeah, all the work. Yeah, we, we have to go to him because he's such a little diva. Yeah, I just simply can't come to Glasgow. I just can't. Like. I know. But so we both went there for him. I mean, I mean, you know, technically we're paying double the train fare. I know. Technically, so you're technically right. Technically, he should just suck it up. Do you know what I mean? I know. And come to Glasgow. Exactly. Instead of, being exactly. A instead of so us so going fish. to Gurik. So Gurik. Oh, I know anybody that listens knows where Matt lives. How great is that? <laughs> Sorry. Well, people know where we live. Do they? Who Glasgow? knows where I live? Yeah, Glasgow. Ah, it looks much smaller than Glasgow. Ah, you should see where I tag the videos on uh, YouTube. <laughs> Matt lives up just, to the kill of Just like, <laughs> oh, just hold on. James lives right there on that little point there. Fab. I know. Pinpoint Fabulous. So. To be honest, you'd have to get through the horrible place I live in to get to me. So I know. So you know. chances of survival I'm are like slim. I'm like an evil kingpin. <laughs> like I just sit in the middle. I just hope somebody will find me. <laughs> anyway... This, like I said, is our little comic of the month. So what we've got today is the comics of July. My birthday month. Yes, yes, yes. Was my birthday month. Uh, read quite a bit, actually. Yeah. But uh, you might be surprised by mine. But you tell us yours first. Oh. You show me. Oh. I'll show you mine if in you fact, show me in yours. In fact, wasn't I supposed to do graphic of the month? That wee bitch just stole my graphic of the month. But you gave it to him, to be fair. Like, you know, we take it in turns, basically. <sighs> and uh, he was like, I'm oh, Matt, you know, you can do the graphic of the month. And I'm actually just too realized. nice for this fucking show, ain't I? You're just, you're just too nice for this world, mate. I think, you should, I think, you should, we, sh I think we should just put you out. Like, oh, thanks. Put you out your misery. <laughs> this world doesn't deserve you. <laughs> 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 you're too good for us. Anyway... My graphic of the month. It's not your graphic of the month, though, is oh, it? Oh, no, it's <laughs> not. My head's up my arse this week, guys. Give me a break. This will be cut out. But it's no but, is it? It will be cut out, because I'm ultimate editor. That is not getting cut out. That's I'm stupid. I'm the Thanos of this podcast. I can wipe anything out. I could insert... I could impersonate you and say, yeah. I like vagina. And guess what? And then leave it in. And you also must be a big lazy bastard because for the course of like seven films you've been trying to get other people to do your dirty work when you could quite easily just do it yourself. I, I do you a lot of work. You've done it to yourself. I do a lot of work here. <laughs> I'll have you know. You do. You do. I don't give you enough appreciation. Ah, it's okay. Would you like a, an appreciation handjob? Nah, it's fine. So selfish, man. Right, I okay. know, shocking, shocking of me. Anyway, on with the book. Yes, my comic of the month. Single issue. Single no issue. Is. is Dark Days the Casting. Oh, yes. okay. Uh, I, ha I had to. I really had to. After the first pre prelude book, this it, it left a lot of questions... Uh, to be answered, and they they did do everything with this book, and they teased a little bit more for the the event that da uh, Dark Days Metal. The creative team for Dark Days of Casting is Scott Snyder and James Tinian the fourth on writing. You've got Jim Lee, Andy Cooper, and John Romita Jr. in pencils. That's John Romita Jr. Like he's you know. That that's like a heavy hitter team right there, like on writing and uh, pencil work. And then for your inks, you've got Scott Williams, Klaus Jansen, and Danny Meeky, all very good guys. And Alex uh, Sinclair and Jeremiah Skipper on colors. That this this is a heavy, heavy duty book, mm. and I will avoid the obvious pun of heavy metal. So, tell us a bit about the, the plot of the book. Well, you're kind of led into the whole history of uh, Hawkman and Hawkgirl. And you're treated with Ra's al Ghul being one of these cloaked figures. So, it's it opens up the possibilities of DC tying in other characters with other history. Which I'm always, always like, I like the fact that something like, say... 
Sabretooth was originally an Iron Fist villain, but then he mitigated into well, X-Men. I mean, the thing is, is it's with, with these kind of things, these characters all do exist in one, one yes. universe, so that they're not exactly... Yeah, they're not tied to down be used to that. In one, do you know what I mean? Like they all live in this same world, so you're likely to see them cross paths with yeah. other people. But it's n- it, I, I like this. It's nice to have little throwaway connections to other characters and other histories. And obviously, Raz Al Ghul was known to be a, a character that's resurrected time and time and time again. So why isn't he into another character's history where they are resurrected time and time again? It's it adds so much in. Yeah, so little because we're only teased a couple pages. So maybe down the line we will see more connection. That maybe if they have a Hawkman, Hawk Girl s- series out, never know. Yeah, well, I, I usually find comics really hit hard when you get surprised by the big villain, and when that big villain is usually somebody else's villain. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the Riddler went to Green Arrow once, and yeah. he was a much better Green Arrow villain than he was a Batman villain. So yeah, it like was, uh, it's interesting as well because it always adds a new dynamic and. And I'm all for reinventing the wheel, like spice it up, change the villains, change characters, you know, all for it. Uh, but we get into Batman fighting a griffin. Of course. On uh, on Greece as well. And long story short, defeats it with help of Wonder Woman and she gives him a blade. The co- It's called the Sun Blade. And it's the eighth metal, which... Is the the event that's this that this yeah. the event that this is preluding to is called Dark Days Metal, and there's been a little bit teased in the last issue of Dark Days of Nth Metal, and that's been teased as Ninth Metal. I'm assuming because it's an obvious fucking pun like connection. So you see Bruce get this blade, and then we are greeted to Duke. And how going up against uh, your boy? Do we know? Do we know what Joker it is? Is it Endgame Joker? <sighs> I think it is. I'm to be pretty certain they've that referenced is. certain things. Like, look at that suit. Look at everything. That is that has to be the end days Joker. He ran about in a black suit. I know, but the last actual time that we saw him, he was in a white suit. Remember, he was sitting in the park bench with Bruce at the end of Scott Snyder's run. Well, yeah, but the last time the, the the end game ended with the Joker trying to get to what was sort of like a cheap, a cheap and cheerful Lazarus bit yeah. under the Batcave, where the two of them were led to be assumed to be crushed. Oh, of course. And obviously we find out Batman wasn't crushed. So where one exists, the, the other has to. to. And that's, I, I don't know. I, I I'm saying it as. It, it has to be the end game Joker. It's got to be. It, it would be stupid to introduce this whole three Joker thing in a book that's not the main Batman series, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it can, o- it can only be one, if you ask me. But yes, so... Yeah, and the way that Joker's talking, it's it seems very likely that he is trying to stop Batman here. But for the good. For dun, dun, dun! Yeah, that's a real, like... Uh, shocker here that Batman is digging deep in this cave for what to get to the core of the earth and we're told that there's something in the core that something is not right with earth so Joker's actually too late to stop it from happening which is a major twist because well you're always under the impression that Joker's there to fuck with Batman but He's actually there to do, to do good this time because he's actually seen everything beyond this metaphorical wall, and he doesn't want that. He he's maybe scared of that. You never know. It's it falls under the whole Joker having a different level of sanity to everybody else. I mean, the first thing you, with the Joker is, oh, he's 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 insane. He's mental. But you know, there was always that conversation with. Is the Joker actually like more sane than the rest is? Is he actually above us in terms of you know how right he is in the heat? So maybe that it does click onto that. Maybe that's one of those things where it's like the Joker is a sort of evil because he wants to be evil, but you know he always knows more than he lets on. Do you know what I mean? Especially with this, like 
That that's the thing. You you only saw the Joker on the last page of the other Dark Days prelude, and it was speaking throughout, just kind of letting on that he knows more than he should. And this one, he's full out. Oh, oh, short of full out explaining everything that he knows, he's desperate to go. Batman's in the wrong. I need to stop him. Which is a a good twist. Reinvent the wheel. All for it. Uh, speaking of Batman, he bumps into Talia and he trades the Sunblade of eighth metal for the ninth metal. Fuck's sake. Which happens to be a sword with a small piece of Shazam's power. Legendary weapons, top trumps. I'll swap you this card for this one, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll s- trade you the soul gem for the power gem. Hmm, really, is that... Is that, is oh, that? Right, okay, I'll trade you the time gem for the reality gem, and, <laughs> you know, just roll with it. Like, it's it's odd, but I... So, uh, does Joker explain anything about what Batman's doing? Because we don't really know what he's doing. And even well, he's got a machine doing. that's drilling and digging into the core of the earth. Now, he, as he says in this page here, I can't let him dig any deeper. There's no telling what will happen next if he does. He doesn't understand how important he is, not like I do. So, he's stopping Batman because he knows something about him. Is he jealous? That's the, that makes I'd, me I'd, quite I jealous. Kn- like, I don't know. If Batman gets to the core of the earth, is he going to become a god? Like, do you, know, you know when he sat on the, the Mobius chair? Yeah. And he became almost godlike. Yeah. Is there something in the core of the earth that could make Batman that again? Because he was actually, in my opinion, he was tempted by that power. Oh, he was tempted by he that power. He was deeply tempted. In fact, he was overcame by it. Yeah. So is there something else that, that could well, take him back to that? I think all the uh, images that have came out from Dark Days is basically spoilers. Skip the next minute of this if you've not read it. Five, four, three, two, one. You've had your chance. Dark Days is the dark multiverse with whatever dark multiverse is ruled by Batman. And there's a Justice League formed of Batman-themed superheroes. So you've got Flash, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Cyborg, but they've all got a Batman edge to it. So is this Batman God evil? He's, yeah, Batman evil god. Ooh, ooh! I made that assumption myself. Yeah. Yay! So that's enough of that, and we will go back to our regular, reg- regular, regularly scheduled reg- broadcast. There we go. Yeah. So I don't know. Like Joker always has an an ulterior motive with everything that he does. I've got a level you see when he crowbarred Green Lantern. That was like the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like, <sighs> just here, here, here's the like. thing: is that going to be? Joker's go-to weapon from now on. Just oh, always, course. always a crowbar. Why never the hand cannon or something? You know. Well, I don't. Don't get me wrong. Like, see when he just belted him with the crowbar, I was like, he actually just smacked Green Lantern with a crowbar. It's, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> not even a normal size crowbar. It's like an industrial size crowbar. It's like something Solomon Grundy would use on the weekends. Aye, aye. It's like a, a really overdone one. Maybe I pulled that out of his pants like, oh, I've got a big one here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. A la Tim Burton's Batman. Uh, yeah, so we, we get a little bit of history with all the characters and stuff. And it's mainly something happens with Duke. Basically, Joker says that he's a metahuman and that Batman's been following his bloodlines. Like, he's got a trace of this metal inside him that's altered him uh, chemically. And he's manifesting some kind of powers. And that's what allows the Joker to escape by distracting them with this happening. And we get Batman, who is not too pleased right after it. The first thing that he says is about the Joker and stuff. How Jordan's giving him shit. And all he says is, I needed them. Like, what does that fucking say? Like, when Batman actually needs a Joker for something. That's desperation. 
Like that, that this is a I would say that the last maybe ten years of Batman have been really good where we've got a bat god who's prepared for every scenario and situation and every eventuality. So it's actually kinda nice that we have this kinda uh, Batman who's struggling and desperate for anything that could happen here. Like this is this isn't the same Batman that uh, killed Dark Side to be honest. This is one that's really clutching at straws. Yeah, he's either really, really scared of something or he really, really wants something. That's what this feels like. Yeah, so it it just feels like he's it, it doesn't feel like he's fighting for something. It feels like he's grabbing something, like he's he's within an arm's length reach of something and he needs to get it. And it's and I just feel like it's something that's for him. Whether it's the infinite power or it's something maybe even more powerful than the Mobius chair. Maybe even It's the thing, Batman's never been a character to seek power. He's he has got power there where he can overcome certain things, but he doesn't use it on a regular basis. Like he's got Kryptonite there to stop Superman. He's got countermeasures to stop every member of the Justice League. But he doesn't use them to fight villains. He'll th- come up with other methods. No, so of course, absolutely. But like you say, this dark multiverse story, is it going to be the evil Batman? Is it going to be, why is he evil? What has happened to him? This is why I'm feeling this is more of a plot that's, why is he being so secretive? If he was trying to save the world, why is he being so secretive to the other heroes? This feels like something he's literally, like, it's personal to him. And if he... why else would he need the Joker? Why else would he basically say, and that as well, he's he's obviously keeping the Joker prisoner. Yeah. But Joker wasn't in a rush to leave. He was trying to stop it. And it doesn't feel like he was trying to stop it just to be a nuisance. He was trying to stop it because there's genuinely, this is not good. Ah, it's something that f- maybe he even fears. If he, maybe there's an underlying, a genuine fear, like we say about how certain characters fear Batman and stuff, and he's seen a, an entire world, an entire multiverse of Batman, and he's like, oh, I don't like, I like playing with one of them, but not this. Like, these are too much for me. Catch so, you after, boys. <laughs> hi. Uh, destroy this for me, please. Uh, see ya. So, to wrap up this issue, uh, how Jordan gives his ring to Duke who constructs this machine that was here. And there's a lot of artifacts. There's Psycho Pirate's Mask, the Owl's Electrum, uh, Hyperelastic Molecules, Ancient Themyscarian and Atlantean Artifacts, Relics of Order and Chaos, and Shazam's uh, sword that we have uh, from Talia. And then something happens... Bruce uses this machine and he witnesses something. He says, darkness. I don't understand. I did everything right, but all I saw was darkness. Now, they're trying to see this threat so that they can counteract it. They're being proactive instead of reactive, which is a fucking great thing to do. How many times this is especially happening in the Justice League comics right now where it's Everything is on about reactive. Reactive against an alien coming down. Reactive against parasites being stuck in the tower. It's all reactive. And I'm at the point where I want to drop the Justice League title, but I'm hoping that there's going to be a really good tie-in with the Dark Days stuff. So I'm sticking it out. I'm trying to stick around with it. But this shows shows the heroes in a different light. They are trying to stop something before it happens, which you do not see very often in comics. And this, uh, the the writing team have got it. Like, DC are on fucking point with this. Scott Snyder needs to be praised heavily for all of his work on Batman. He's created, he's created an entirely different Batman in... Tom King is taking it in a slightly different direction by having Bruce, like we discussed earlier, talking about his parents more, showing more about his parents. Is there something going to be tied in with that? Who knows? But uh, after that, we're presented with the, uh, I'll say, like, 
the 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 dark multiverse Batman, and they say the final seal is broken. All these generations of sacrifices at hand, and it just shows you bats. The dark knights are coming, which I love. That's what they're called. That's their Justice League. The Dark Knights. It's beautiful. And by the looks of it, we can see. Well, we've got Wonder Woman. She's definitely there. You've got Flash. Yep, you've got the Flash. You've there. got. I think that's Batman. I think that is Aquaman. I don't know what one that is. Maybe Cyborg. And then it says, and with them, the true father of Batman. Who's overlooking it all? That is terrifying. That is pretty terrifying. So. And uh, I, c- I can't give this anything other than a 10. It's teased everything to come in Dark Days so well that it is crafting a beautiful, beautiful tale with us. Uh, the artwork, okay, it's got different artists in, on board, which can be very off putting, but with this, the r- it's handled so well. I can't see anything wrong with this title. Yeah, I mean, wherever it goes will certainly be very interesting. I mean, we're painting Batman in a completely different light, which is always interesting because, again, reinvent the wheel. I mean, they've made Captain America. Yeah, evil. Hydra. Yep. And now Batman's kind of being alluded to be evil. So we don't know. Yes, we do not. And I like not knowing. So... I think it's been. I, I mean, I think I think that issue was particularly interesting. Again, you only see a little bit of Rachel Ghoul. We see a, a bit more of the Joker, but not too much. And we're still trying to figure out which Joker he is. Yeah. Because you know, as a the end game Joker, as a the War of Jokes and Riddles Joker, we we don't know. So it's it's trying to figure it out, and we just have to wait and see where it goes. But uh, I'll yeah. tell you, Mario. Yeah. Um, what is your comic of the month, James? My comic of the month. Well, I'll tell you what my comic of the month is. It's a dark horse. Ooh. It's a dark horse comic. Uh, it comes from the old favourite film. What one's that? And it is Predator Hunters. Ooh, now, nice. Sh- now I've read issue three of that. Yes. And I've got to tell you, I really, really enjoy it. Like, so I'll give you a little breakdown of it. Aboard the Dodger, a yacht designed as a science research vessel, the hunter team seeks its quarry on a deceptively beautiful island in the Bunting Archipelago. We'll go with that. Before the night is out, modern technology and advanced weapons will be tested against animal cunning and savage fury. Predator Hunters is scripted by Chris Warner. The art is done by Francesco Ruiz Velasco. And what can I say? It's, it's quite good. It's, it's really kind of quite good, actually. I'll say this right f- uh, for the start. Uh, what I really like about this is the covers. The, the covers, the covers are, are stinkingly cheesy of like 80s kind of vibe, you know? The Predator logo has got to be the, the cheesiest thing about it. But oh, aye. It's the actual predator designs and everything are just fantastic. Like, it's absolutely beautiful. Like, I and then you look at these colourful covers, then you get right into the book, and it's nothing like that. Like well, that's the thing. You sometimes you need uh, a a good hook to get you in. Oh, I definitely. Predator Hunters is from you know from the issues I've read is just like you say, deceptively. Gorgeous. I mean, issue three takes us to this sort of. It's on this same island before the predators are attacked, I presume, and it's kind of happening at a big kind of gathering, a feast of such. And we have certain characters who are all kind of sitting there talking about, like, oh, well, you know, like, you know, this is paradise. This is, this is everything we could have wanted. And it just kind of gives you this insight to the people who lived there. You don't really catch names it's your sort of introduction to the book even though this is issue three so you know in issues one and two we're getting a bit more from the soldiers and the people on the boat and stuff like that but this is them at the island now this is them here and ready to go so this is i I presume that these first pages are sort of your intro to the island you know what was on the island beforehand and yeah it kind of ends with some people departing you know, leaving. And then we find ourselves on the ship. The Dro- the Drugar 
whatever it's called. But uh, we have our soldiers, and they're all basically saying, right, so we need to go in, and they come across. What do they come across, Mario? They come across oh, classic yeah. predator territory. Yeah. Uh, literally skulls and body parts attached to spikes. Of course, why not? Yeah, so I guess they're going in, and we're introduced, we see a kind of big, sort of lovely shot of the whole team getting ready to go out, um, and basically, I'm saying, oh, you're coming with us, you know, it's, it's, it's very colonial marines, you know, it's very much, ah, oh, we're going to be alright, and it's going to be good, it's going to be your typical job, X, Y, Z, and as we know from experience, Mario, nothing goes right, nothing goes it? right, no, does it, um, so, you know, you get the casual banter, you know, you've got the sort of blonde-headed guy um, who's sort of like the, the jokey wisecracker. And we kind of... I, I like these... I like this artwork. It's the, this blue, this, you know, this sort of weird, creepy tense vibe. Like, the blue hue just kind of makes it feel like they're somewhere completely different. So, you know, they're... <laughs> It's it's pretty much this this book is that I can tell is a prelude to what's to come. You know, it's it's them just kind of going there. It sets the scene, and they go in. They're kind of walking around. They get attacked by, you know, a, a, a tiger basically. Uh, very Jungle Book style, I must oh, admit. Of course. <laughs> uh, they're like tiger, ah! and they're like, oh yeah, great, fantastic, nice work. Swain is the blonde-haired guy. Now, Swain, from this one scene, no, I think he has the general human reaction to anyone who gets attacked by a tiger. But I have a feeling that this Swain guy has a bit of another story to him. I think he's a bit... Gay? Traumatically stressed. I was going to say... Which is uh, two uh, different when things. When, when, <laughs> when you said uh, he's a jokey, funny one, I went, what, you mean the gay one? It's like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And, you know... This guy shouts tiger, and as he shouts tiger, what happens? Spear right through him. No, not even that. I love the whole uh, predator speech bubble. It's just copying tiger. <laughs> tiger. Because <laughs> obviously that's one of their abilities, to mimic human, well, sh- mimic and language. it's just a spear. Yeah. And it's, it's so subtle and so... Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, which is great, because to capture what the predator can do in a book... There's a lot, I would say, simpler, but it's trying to keep it interesting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And um, <laughs> the guy, he's like sort of holding onto the spear, and he's just like, everybody's talking around him, and he's just like, this is inconvenient. <laughs> like, <laughs> and they catch, th- they've got thermal imaging, which I think is interesting, because it's... Th- well, they've caught the predator tech from yeah. previous uh, assaults by the predator from previous hunts. So they catch the the predator on the thermal imaging, uh, which is good because they get to play the predator at their own game. Yes, and they are unrelenting. Like this is the bit where you realise these people are actually killers. Like they kill, they have killed predators before. Yes, they have done. That is this. why they are there. And um, I love it. They're there and they know what they're getting into, which is so refreshing. You know, to see people who know what they're going up against, and we see this sort of bombardment on this predator. So yeah, then we're introduced to Mandy who runs in. She's the point woman and uh, butch lesbian of the team, I would say. Uh, love her. She's pretty cool. So she's like, oh, I'm going to sort it. She's, she loves a fight. I can tell this girl loves a fight and it's great. And they find, they basically find the predator and the predator like, basically brings the hammer down on one of the crew and effectively kills him. And as the predator tries to run away, shot dead. Which is actually kind of anticlimactic because you're always seeing the predator like going up against so much against them and surviving. So it was actually kind of nice to see it happen so soon. But there is actually a wee twist to this comic, isn't there? Of course there is. Of course there is. So they kill the predator, which I like because they org- they organise and orchestrate themselves as a team. And you can see that. And, you know, the predator just sits there kind of gargling, I think, in its own language. It's just about to die. And it hits the ground, and they're like, and someone's like, oh, hey, over here. And they find a lovely old man uh, tied up to a tree. And he's like, oh, help me out, help me out. And they let him out. <laughs> I love this line. <laughs> it's like, 
hey, how are you holding up all the time? And it's like, we have to get out of here. And it's like, we have to get out of here now. And he's like, oh, don't worry, my friend. You are safe. It is dead. And he's like, it? And he's like, what do you mean, it? There's, there's another three of them. And that is your cliffhanger for the series, for this comic. It's it's the, it's the perfect cliffhanger, I'm not going to lie. It's like somebody who's been on that island and has obviously been trapped there by aye, the Predator. Aye, to then it's, go... It's there for either game or... Bait. Me- yeah. Bait. Yeah. Bait. And yeah. that whole thing where he's like, what do you mean you kill it? There's, there's more of them, do you know what I mean? And that's just a lovely little cliffhanger that takes you into Predator Hunters 4. Yes. And... And what would you rate it? What would I rate it? Oh, I'd rate it. I'd give, I'd, give, I'd give this one a six. Now, I like it. The artwork's great in it, but nothing much really happens in it. Well, they, so, they, so get, a they, they get a predator. They get a predator. Go up against it. They lose a member of the team and they kill it. Yeah, they lose a member of the team that, again, in typical horror films, isn't really explored. <laughs> like, it's it's not someone important. Ah, it's so just cannon fodder for it. It's just cannon fodder, you know, and I like the art, I like everything about it, I like what it builds up to. It's got this sort of Gears of War-esque kind of nighttime colour palette, which is quite nice. These guys going in to fight monsters, they know what they're getting into, and yeah, they have a few casualties, they save the old guy, and then he's like, oh no, wait, there's more. I think issue four is going to be, because it's a five-part series, I think issue four is going to be so, so barbaric. I think it's going to be a lot. Because you're going to have these guys going up against three predators. There's going to be some losses. There's going to be some serious action. So in terms of, like, just continuing the story, you know, kind of just taking it from where it was to where it is now, yeah, it does It does its job. You know, it, it it's good. Uh, maybe a six is a bit harsh. Maybe a seven. Okay. Maybe it'll be seven. Cool, cool. And with that, we head to travel back in time to... Well, fucking time travel, to yes! Y- to younger Mario, younger James, and always young Matt for Graphic of the Month. And this brings us into our graphic throwback section of the show. Today, it's not my choice, and it's not James's choice. We decided to be a little bit generous this time round. And we've given the graphic of the month to Matt. I'm sorry. Knock it on. <laughs> um, so this month, what I've chose is Green Arrow Year One. Nice. Um, it was released roughly about nine years ago. Yeah, 2008. 2007, 2008. Yeah. Um, it's by, well, the writer's Andy Diggle. And the creative team on it is... is it Jock say? is artist. Jock, David Barron, and Jared K. Flit- Fletcher is the letterer. Yep. Uh, what da- does David Barron? Da- David Barron's a colourist. Nice. Um, <laughs> basics. Give, give, give us a little rundown of the story, right, mate. So, rundown of the story is basically just the origin story of Green Arrow. Um, I'm not sure if this was... I'm thinking this is just before the New 52. After. Yeah, New 52 was 2011, 12. Right. Um, so, as I said, the origin story of Green Arrow, where, if you ever watch Arrow, is basically the same, where it's on the island and comes up against problems and stuff. Yeah. Main story in this one is, well, uh, this is just the basic starting of wh- when he got lost. I don't know for how long the whole story takes place over, there's no real indication of it. It feels pretty quick, like, I don't think this is the full time that he's been on the island, but that is maybe... First couple of weeks he's there, and he already runs into trouble. Um, what happens in it is, he, as as most of you will know, Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, gets stranded on a desert island, and he's stuck there for a good couple of years before he's rescued, and when he comes back, he becomes Green Arrow. Um, this is a good jumping on point if for anybody that doesn't know Green Arrow, or someone who's looking for a sort of cover of the origin story. Um, I highly recommend it, because... I got into it from, obviously, the Arrow TV show when it originally started, and it's a good jumping on point, as I said. Um, how how does how does the uh, origin story feel compared to something that uh, obviously has been maybe a little bit butchered for a TV show? How does it compare to that? Obviously, it's a newer generation 
of origin mm-hmm. for the character because obviously, same same with every character they've had their rebirths and secret origins and uh, unexplained bastard son of a witch whore origin. You know, the, how how does it feel? Is that is that your assumption of Damien Wayne or? <laughs> 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 Uh, less said Careful. the better about him. <laughs> right. Um, so, as it, like this is a bit more of a redo of the origin story. It has, like, because obviously back in the day when Gunaro was originally brought out, like they wouldn't have been had so much, you know, drug involvement and stuff like that like they do nowadays. But this one is is more more modernized in a way. Um, on the island, like you find out that China White, uh, which is actually pronounced China Way, like, I didn't really know until I watched the show. So it's something that the show has educated me on. Um, as basically, it is essentially as Lian Yu. Um, I think that is still the island what it's called in the in the in the book. Um, she has pretty much taken over the island under the role of she's a drug lord and she's growing poppies to make heroin, pretty much. Um, and oh, Oliver Queen discovers all this and notice, uh, finds out that she's using slave labour and whatnot and tries to basically set everybody free. Um, China White is also helped out by Oliver's old bodyguard, well, sort of bodyguard, like more of like his adrenaline junkie helping fix her sort of thing. Um, he's the one that always took Oliver out on mad expeditions because they wanted to just have a mad time with it. Um, this is also one of the pe- people that Oliver used to respect a lot, to, and he learned a lot from. So this is basically he taught him all the sort of survival techniques that you would ever need in the wild and stuff like that. Um, so basically, kind of like he's he's Batman to Robin. Aye, aye, essentially. Um, but when he finds out, like he's basically gets betrayed while they're on the boat and shot and thrown overboard, and he pretty much makes off with the yacht, the money, and everything else, as you expect. And then, obviously, Oliver Queen washes up on the only island that he's not meant to wash up on. Um, they're all kind of scales off from there. Um, it's classic Green Arrow, pretty much. It's good drugs. Party, well, that, that, you know? let, let's get into that. Uh, in this day and age, you've, you've got shows like Breaking Bad, where... <sighs> They're, they're, they're f- they they take a seemingly bland person and then flip it on its head, and the thing at the center of that is drugs. drugs. Yeah, drugs are and bad. Oh yeah, drugs are bad. Well, wait a minute, right? Are we forgetting the most important substance abuser in the world of comics, Grant Morrison? If he was not on drugs, we wouldn't have got half the shit. That kept me gone through my teenage years, right? Grant Morrison delivers every time. So maybe, maybe certain drugs are bad. Right? Let's let's say that. Let's say that. You want to question what Grant Morrison was on? Have you read Batman or IP? That's some pretty weird shit. But what I'm saying is, like, naturally in the modern day environment, people are so uh, numbed to drugs. I mean, it used to be very taboo. It used to be something that people yeah talk about. Whereas nowadays, it's like quite common in the world of the comics and TV, stuff like that. So it's only natural to have these kind of things there and the kind of people that Oliver Queen is dealing with. Yeah, as far as comics are concerned, there uh, in the last few years there's been a lot of drug involvement in comic book stories. Take Kevin Smith's run on Spider-Man, where him and Black Cat are after a drug dealer who drugs one of her friends, I believe. And the drug dealer is named Mr. Brownstone. He teleports drugs straight into their system, negating any need for marks or needles on the person. And it's, you know, I, w- I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. It, it's a good thing is a, to raise awareness to kids, especially, that this kind of stuff, although it gives you a good rush, uh, not speaking personally, it gives you a good rush that they can be dangerous to you. Like, th- you know, you see it in TV shows that, that oh, people taking drugs and whatever. Like, uh, hell, look at one of Scotland's most famous movies, Train Spotting. 
people doing drugs and that and stuff and uh, how like the characters are are, are majorly affected in it. Yeah, I mean, it's the kind of people that Oliver Queen is dealing with. I mean, Oliver Queen can be compared to maybe characters like, and before you judge, a bit like Iron Fist in terms of the corporation side of it, you know, he's dealing with people who know a lot more than he does and make a business off of the back of other people, which is a good platform for Oliver Queen to step up onto, like, a reason to fight effectively, and obviously, like you're saying with the slave labour, that's a point of heroism where he's like, I need to save these people, I need to get them away. So, you know, not thinking of the consequences after that, he just sees it as point blank, these people need to be saved. Which is a very good thing to have in a superhero comic, because I feel a lot of comics do lack it sometimes nowadays. That hero moment, that defining, I need to do this. So, I think that's a pretty good point. Mm -hmm. Well, on the subject of this, this is also something cause obviously drugs were very taboo like way back well not way back but you know a good yeah um, it's been quite recent that they've so obviously it's been since like the late 80s that drugs have only really started coming into comics as heavy as they have sort of thing yeah um i remember like green arrow and green lantern was one of the very well, I don't know if it was the first one, but it was definitely one of the ones to raise a lot of awareness about the um, special heroin, because there was the storyline of when Roy Harper, who was uh, playing Speed, who was Speedy at the time, was known uh, was found out to be a heroin user. Um, I remember like reading that, like reading that for the first time, and obviously I I didn't read it at the time because I wasn't about it at the time, but reading that well, when I did, it was kind of powerful, like, the message they were kind of giving, because they were kind of raising awareness in a way that not many people, because it was because it was such a taboo thing to talk about, and then it's in, like, obviously a comic book that everybody c- could read, um, yeah. and it, uh, it was a good way to kind of introduce the awareness of it, sort of thing, so it is good to do things like that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a common street-level hero thing to do, I mean, Green Arrow is a street-level hero. And, you know, normally they will fight against drugs. Like, the Defenders do it daily. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, if you want to talk about drugs in comics, look at the Iron Man Demon in a Bottle storyline, where he's suffering for his alcoholism. Things like this, you know, it's a big part in, you know, like, comic book storylines, which, and obviously today it's still relevant, so. Yeah, you you do find that quite a lot, that the human characters, the ones that are the street level ones, not... Like not like your Superman or someone, like those are the ones that are majorly affected by it. Dealing with human problems. Oh yeah, and yeah, well, if you want to look at comics being an influence and being influenced by the surrounding environment of society, just take a look at the X Men. Like, look why that was made. It's bl- like black rights and. Obviously, they they further went that way with it was well gay characters, and that's when the whole legacy virus came about because of AIDS that was spread amongst in the I think that was the nineties uh, the legacy virus came about. So, comics are influenced by society, and obviously, that Green Lantern Green Arrow story is just a. It's another great thing that comics do. It's helping people to be aware. And here's the thing. We're not saying, like, oh, adults are forbidden to read comics. We all know fucking adults read comics. We read comics. Everyone reads comics nowadays. So everything, like, it is mainly aimed at kids. But seeing stuff like that will... You said yourself, Matt, that it left a lasting impression on you. Hell, train spotting I watched God knows how many years ago, and I have never wanted to do any drugs or anything, all because of the horror of watching that and going, well, why would I want to do that to myself? Yes, so, as a street-level hero thing to fight, I mean, they fight human problems, and drugs and addiction and stuff like that is a very human thing, which is obviously plays a relative role in this book. 
Okay, back to the comics because yes. we're starting to sound like an after school special. Yes. Um, <laughs> right, so, as I said, China White uh, is pretty much taking over the island. She's growing heroin. She's using slave labour and Green Arrows. All the bad things in life. Yeah, doing all that stuff. Um, Green Arrow pretty much starts off, like, all of her queen starts off pretty poorly because obviously he's been cast he's been cast away like chucked overboard he doesn't know where the hell he is um as you would you know after a mad night out um <laughs> so what he does is he basically cause i think before he gets on the boat he's at an auction and he ends up winning the, the actual bow of the guy i can't remember the name of the guy the guy that was in the original robin hood movie and apparently yeah. he was ov- he was taught by the stunt actor a stu- a stuntman that showed him how to do all the trick shots and all that. So he is already pretty trained with a bow. So he finds an old axle from a truck and fashions a bow out of it. Which, looking at it in, in the artwork, it does actually look doable. But I've, I've I've tried to pick one of them axles up before. It's not light. Like, I don't know how the hell he's, he would be seen running about with one of these things. But nevertheless, he, he manages to do it. Um, he goes off and he starts fighting off some of the main sort of goons as it would be um, and then he ends up getting shot a good few times and one of the slaves sees this and she she rescues him and he wakes up and he finds out that she's given him hang it, some he- the heroin to fight off like to make sure they can make it through as a, basically as an IV sort of thing because that's the only thing they've got um, so he's, he ends up out of his face for about five days before like a reawakening, and obviously it's wh- the way the way it's portrayed is basically like going to come down sort of thing, and it looks y- you kind of feel for him a wee bit, like you're like he didn't really want this sort of thing, but at the same time, obviously he had to do it. Yeah, no r- it's no needed choice. for his survival. Aye, um, so after that, like he finds the, the it's, I don't, it's not the Queen's Gambit in this, but it's something, I can't remember the name. But it's his yacht, obviously, um, and then he ends up finding the bow that he won at the auction and whatnot, and then he fashions like the hood and all that. And this is basically cast away Green Arrow. Yeah. And he, he finds a pair of army boots after one of the guys he killed as well, which is always handy. Of course. Um, falling on from that, like, takes down China White. And after that, I don't know if it pa- I think it pans over, like, just kind of overviews of the next couple of years. And then he's found on the island. And then he goes back to Star City and all kind of writes itself after that, literally. Um... It's pre f- New Fifty Two, so like I wasn't. Uh, that's when I kind of started getting into Green Arrow. Was around about New Fifty Two, so I thought like I'll give it, I'll read back a bit. I had read like the classics and stuff like yeah. that, but nothing like I hadn't read any detail about it, and I hadn't really got a, a proper origin story because I'd heard so much stuff over the internet about origin story for Green Lantern or Green Arrow. Then are you here? <laughs> um, so let's move on to the art style of yes. the book. What do you think? Uh, I quite enjoyed that. It's wasn't too like in your face sort of art- artwork like the way some of the artists can be from time to time. Like it was subtle and it is actually really easy to follow. Um, even for a digital download, which I got it on because I do I do like the deliberate. Sorry, I mean you'll find it with Green Lantern as well. The the the, the deliberate overuse of the color green. Yeah. I like that because uh, in a lot of books, you know, that you read, sometimes they'll, they'll miss that detail. But there's the bit when he's on the island and he pu- he just has the the green hood on, and that just stands out for everything else, and it it becomes like the sort of the the, the it basically he's calling to have the guy in the green hood. You know, that's what he, that's what he would become known as, and that over you see it just constantly kind of just adds a really nice touch to it. Mm. Like, I really, really like that. I mean, I like the use of strong colours in TV, film, books. So, in that per- in this particular book, they do overemphasize it, which I think is really, really nice. And gives it a nice wee touch. Some of the sort of night scenes in it as well look sort of like the old Batman cartoon where they done it on the black paper. Like, that's the way, obviously, it was shot. Yeah. So, it looks like that's the way they've probably... Or that's the, way the idea they were going for. And it really helps, like... Because, obviously, he's on a desert island and... He's not just going to be out at night, like on a d- on a desert island. But when he is out on it, like you can, the artwork really helps. Like, I'm not sure that you really need much help imagining what it's like at night. But yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> something about the art style as well. It, like, 
I've mentioned it before. Uh, the iconic, memorable artists have a perfect style. In Jock's style, is pretty iconic. It's, it's. I wouldn't say it's simplified, but it's, it's, n- it's nicely refined. If you if you get my drift, it's. Aye. Yeah, it's uh, it is very nicely simplified, and it's a it's a very refined art style. It's looking at it. It's the colorist David Barron. David Barron. It definitely chose a nice palette for it. It's nice. it's something that maybe it is underused. You see a lot of comics, and they take place in cities and metropolises of whatever kind and it's always your greys and kind of yellows and stuff but this is a very nice nice really? style it's it's classic it's proper it's DC like when you yeah, think about it cause yeah, like not, not to kind of you know throw the Marvel DC gauntlet down here right but DC is always meant to be a wee bit darker a wee well oh, it's meant to be gritty aye like I say the, the um, like I say the colour palette in this is subtle and when you see the green it stands out. It's Aye. made to stand out. All of our Queen and the Green Arrow are made to stand out, and that's why I think it just works, especially on the desert island. So, yeah, I mean, overall, I, I kind of like the art style. I think it, I, I won't criticise any of the art unless it's really bad, like, you know, Marvel now, She-Hulk really bad. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 think it, I, think, I, think, I think it's general. I think it's DC's go-to sort of art style. Aye. But, uh it's the colour palette and stuff that really makes it stand out, which I think is really, really nice and really kind of breaks it up a bit. It's a good change for me as well, because I'm, I'm currently the only thing like I really read is like Batman and Robin or Teen Titans, which is like, you know, nearly every colour in the bloody rainbow. <laughs> and then you go on to something like this and it feels a lot more gritty, like looks a lot more gritty and whatnot. Um, so it's a good sort of contrast between what, like if that's what you usually read, like to try and try something new. I know most people don't like getting out of their comfort zones when this sort of thing, but like, you never really know till you've actually tried it. And it was a good kind of jumping on point, as I said. Yeah, yeah. It, that's the thing, you can't really fault uh, Year One Stories or Secret Origins. It, they introduced some... I know a new element that for a character that's maybe 40, 50 years old, and hell, change is always good. Tweaking things, refining things adding a modern edge to it, like the drugs and mm-hmm. slavery, it's still, th- those two things are very prominent in this day and age. Cause it's still, somehow. So it's it's nice to see this involvement of... It's good, it's, uh, it's good to see like the characters evolve, like in a way as well. Like, yeah. Even though it is them um, essentially just starting out again, but it's like the ca- evolving of the origin story. Because like, I've, I don't know if this is true, but I remember like someone saying that the in the original origin story for Green, Ar- uh, Green Arrow, like his parents were actually killed by a rhino or some shit like that. Like they weren't on the b- they weren't on the yacht with him or nothing like that. It was before, and like I don't know if this was true. I might be just tripping. Why not? Why, Why not? not? Exactly. Why it's not? It's creative. It's different, you know. But Bruce like Bruce Wayne's were shot in an alley. Fucking doesn't matter. That's understandable. Whatever you want. A rhino's interesting. It's Aye. different. But it's cause like obviously that was like Green Arrow came out around about the forties, fifties, I think. Um. And obviously, trying to inter- like doing an origin story like that nowadays, you're going to end up going down the route of like Deadpool like yeah. origin story. So you can't really take the character seriously if you know that's part of his origin story. I feel um, so it's good to kind of update in those sort of things, and obviously kind of keep it a wee bit more current because um, obviously stories evolve. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Times change, so change with the times. No. Right. Uh, so. Matthew. Jesus, full name. I know. <laughs> S- it's, it's serious time now. What do you rate this out mm. of 10? Out of 10, out of um, 10. I'd probably give it 7, maybe an 8. Um, it's a really good story. Uh, it's a really good jumping on point. Um, artwork's amazing. Uh, but I feel just because I, I feel I've only given it l- a low ranking because I'm not a massive I, I've not read hundreds of Green Arrow and I don't know how it compares to everything else. So I feel like that's that's been sort of like neutral. Like it's not it's not terrible and it's but it's 
I wouldn't say it's... It's above average. Ah, it's, wor- it's, it's worth reading. I'd say that. Definitely worth yeah, reading. Do you feel like you learn something for Green Arrow when you read it? Aye. For the like character? Aye. I feel like I've learned a bit more inter- information on a character that I do enjoy reading. Well, like I say, as long as the story is consistent and it's aesthetically pleasing, mm. then you know it does its job as a comic book. And I'm I'm no big on Green Arrow, like I'm not big on the show or anything like that. But I can I respect where his character comes from. I respect who his character is, and the fact that he is genuinely just a sound cunt. Like he's no a he's not a dick, you know. He's no Superman. Do you know what I mean? So I I, I like that. I like that. And I've read bits and bobs of the book and stuff like that. And I think for the story I'm getting from it, I should sit down and read it. So I'll definitely take the time to do that. It does yeah. seem pretty cool. Yeah, it's I d- I do love artwork that's that's really stand out and this is a book that is a pretty stand out book. Uh I like yourself, I've I'm not a very big fan of Green Arrow Matt. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's just a character I'd, I'd need to sit down and properly read into. But I, n- I can't see any fault with the book. You know, it's it does its job. It's a refreshing tale. Yeah, no, like, all for it. It's one of the ones, like, I've only recently started to get back into reading Green Arrow again. Because, um, as I said, I read the, like, the older stuff, like the Green Arrow, Green Lantern stuff. So this is what where I kind of sort of thought, do you know what, I'm going to find out the origin story because where else do you start and then that kind of got me interested and i'll read a wee bit more i started i started reading the new 52 stuff which most people find kind of hit and miss but i thought the green arrow new 52 stuff was not bad like yeah well i mean i think ultimately it's just a refresher aye, green I saw arrow. you pick up you can read the character and then you can go read anything else with them so it, it's a good like you say it's a good starting point if you want to get into green arrow so i mean i think that that it does its p- it serves its purpose as a book. Well, uh, that's the end of this review. Yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed our uh, comic of the month and graphic throwback. Uh, also, uh, you know, drugs. Yes, yeah, our little drugs around. <laughs> always, always welcome. So, Matthew, do you want to wrap up the show? Okay, third attempt. Yeah. Um, so. You can reach us out on SoundCloud, iTunes. Uh, We're also on YouTube now as well, where I'll soon be making an appearance on showing you how to make some cheap cosplay props uh, from stuff around the house. Um, So it's definitely something to look into. Uh, We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and that's about it just now. Yep, and uh, if you want to buy yourself a little tea from Ripped Apparel, you can use our code Glaswegian Geeks, all one word, to save yourself a cool ten percent. Because why not? You need clothes. You can't go outside with it your with your nips out. You know. Plus it's summer, so you know. Good Matt, time, good you're, you're not selling it. You know, summer you can have m- like your top off and stuff. Winter's coming. Ah, like uh, what I done now? Uh, like what I done now? Uh. So you need to wrap up with a nice hoodie and get ten percent off that, because you know. We like things as well. Right, so this is Matt, Mario and James signing off for Glaswegian Geeks. Geek out!